Well, for all of you that are with us, tuned in tonight, uh, I wish I could say it's, gl it's good to see you, because I can't see you, obviously, but hopefully it's good to see me. So, uh, this is uh, a crazy time that, that we're living in, and I sure hope that you are all uh, doing everything you can to stay healthy, and uh, uh, again, I uh, sent out my little note this week about... Uh, Revelation, the coronavirus, end of the world, all, and, and I don't uh, want you to think that I'm going to deal with all of that tonight. We're tracking through the book of Revelation. This is our third session. Obviously, if you're just joining us for the first time, uh, you can go back and catch up on the previous two, either by going to the HighlineCC.org uh, uh, website, the church website, or to BobBelts.com. There's a link there to go back and uh, catch up with us. I do want to say this, one of the things that I've thought about, particularly as we're uh, launching into this book that talks about uh, a time that's coming, uh, leading up ultimately to the return of Jesus Christ, and uh, a time uh, also ultimately where the, the heavens and the earth as we know it uh, are going to be in an instant gone, and in a nanosecond, a new heavens and a new earth uh, will be the reality that we can experience. And, uh, but the coronavirus, one of the things that it had me thinking about, again, as I said in my little text, um, certainly in the book of Revelation, one of the um, kind of scary parts of uh, the time that we refer to as a tribulation that we get into a little bit further on down the line in the book of Revelation, really beginning in about chapter 6, uh, the future part of Revelation begins in chapter 4, but in chapter 6, as things begin to be unfolded and we see what's going to happen leading up to the return of Christ, uh, plague is one of the realities of that. And, and I think that one of the positive or benefits of being involved in the kind of a situation we're in right now is to kind of drive some of the reality of that home uh, my own uh, feeling is that the coronavirus is not uh, the plague of revelation. Uh, time will tell. Uh, we have a, a few weeks here to kind of see how things pan out. You know, by the way, as you pray, too, um, I think it's great that our president uh, would like to see things back on track. And, of course, he's very optimistic. He'd like to see people in church by Easter. I think we should pray that because it would be really great uh, to be able to come together on Easter and to celebrate, you know, what, what's happened in response to prayer. So in terms of the virus, though, again, just uh, realizing that a time is coming where things are going to be crazy. And uh, whether we will be here or not is another topic we'll be dealing with in Revelation. Some people believe will be taken out of the world. Believers will be taken out of the world before that final seven-year period of human history, again, called the Tribulation. Others think we'll be here, we'll go through it. Some think we'll go through part of it. Some think we'll go through all of it. But it is, to me, this, uh, you know, this reality we're dealing with kind of drives home that uh, these things are going to happen. And uh, so, again, it's, uh, you know, uh, Jesus talked about birth pangs in Matthew chapter 24, which seems to indicate that some of the signs will increase both in terms of intensity and frequency. And, and so, uh, you know, there, there, there are going to be some pretty uh, critical times coming. And whether we're the generation that will see that or not, again, is a little bit... Uh, you know, kind of out there, but as we move on through the book of Revelation, I will be kind of looking at things going on in the world today and uh, how they fit into the, the prophetic picture in the scriptures, not just Revelation, but other passages that, that build this picture of what life will be like leading up to the return of Christ. Tonight, we really enter into what I would consider the second part of the book of Revelation. You might remember that in verse 19 of chapter 1, when we were looking at some of the background in chapter 1, that uh, Jesus told John to write, and he really told him to write three things. The things that are, I, what you've seen, the things that are, and the things that will take place after these things. And I really think that uh, that that the first chapter of the book of Revelation, John wrote uh, what he has seen there, 
Uh, and of course, it's an amazing uh, experience that John has here on the island of Patmos. So we'll look a little bit more of that tonight, too. Uh, and, and so chapter one, what he sees, he writes about. Uh, chapters two and three are really unique. They're different from anything else in the book of Revelation. There are seven letters that Jesus literally dictates to John to send to seven churches there in the area of Asia Minor, uh, where John had come, I, we believe, tradition tells us, after the destruction of Jerusalem, and came to Ephesus on the coast of what's modern-day Turkey, but was ancient uh, province uh, of the Roman province of Asia. And, uh, and so uh, the, those letters are really dealing with the situation that was taking place right at that time, the things that are. And so chapters 2 and 3 really you know, cover that part of the material. And then chapters four through the end of the book uh, really deal with the futuristic dimension of the book of Revelation, things that are yet uh, to come. And of course, we will move through uh, all of the book of Revelation in our, in our times together. So tonight we, we launch into the second part of the book and uh, these letters to these seven churches. So again, uh, you know, you might remember that uh, John is uh, exiled on the island of Patmos, and, and you can see here that, again, the churches that he's going to write to are all there, and again, what is modern-day Turkey. But off the coast of Ephesus was this island of Patmos where John is banished. And we believe that this takes place around 95 A.D., the Roman Emperor Domitian has uh, launched a persecution against the early church. Uh, he demanded emperor worship and uh, those that were unwilling to uh, deny Christ and to uh, confess that Domitian or that Caesar is Lord and to, to uh, worship him by burning a pinch of incense, some were put to death. Uh, and some were banished. Uh, they, they, it was really a very difficult time to be a follower of Christ. And John is now, as he says, because of the word of God, the testimony of Christ on this little island of Patmos. And, and in what had to be a time, uh, you know, much darker, I think, than what we're experiencing, this time of persecution and great difficulty. And, and John probably at this point being banished has lost all of his rights as a citizen, probably lost all of his property. Uh, tradition tells us that he was working in the mines on Patmos, and he's an old man, extremely difficult. And, and my sense is that at the time that Revelation is written, that believers, a lot of them are struggling. You know, they're, they're asking the question, you know, well, you know, where's God in all of this? And, and Jesus said he was coming again, and yet, you know, what's going on and, and what's happening? And, and to answer some of those questions, uh, Jesus himself gives John a vision, appears to him there on the island of Patmos, and again in a, uh, a very symbolic kind of a form, what's called apocalyptic literature, uh, truth communicated in signs and symbols, and, and, and it's, it's mind-blowing for John. And again, he tells us that when he looks and he sees the risen and exalted Christ, that he falls on his feet as though dead. And so he's told to write, and uh, in the first chapter, we saw verse 11, that Jesus says to him, write in a book what you see, and then send it to the seven churches. And of course, uh, he does. He, he, he's obedient to that. And he, he writes what he has seen, and ultimately, all that is contained in the book of Revelation, we're told that, you know, that he greets them. He's writing now, John, doing what Jesus told him to, to the seven churches in the province of Asia. And as he's writing again, uh, he, he comes to this point where Jesus now begins to tell him to write these letters to these seven churches. I want to say just a word about what I think the, the primary theme of the letters are. And Actually, in a sense, along with the theme of the return of Christ, one of the major threads that weaves its way all the way through the book is a, uh, a concept uh, that is sometimes it's translated as overcoming. 
Sometimes it's translated as conquering. Uh, sometimes it's translated as victorious. I, I use the New International Version, and in the New International Version, uh, it's translated as overcoming. You know, it's funny because when I wrote my first book on the book of Revelation, which was 40 years ago, which is a little mind-boggling now to think about, but I called it How to Survive the End of the World. And I think that was a bad title because the book really isn't about simply surviving. The book is really about overcoming that Greek word, nikao, that is translated in that way, to prevail, to get the victory, to overcome. And that's the, one of the just main messages of the whole book, but certainly of the letters. And in every one of these seven letters, Jesus is going to make a statement about to the one that overcomes. And, and what is it that they have to overcome? I think there's probably three huge challenges that they were facing, and although we might not be facing in exactly the same way, some of these things are true of us too. Obviously, part of what the early church at the end of the first century was facing was present persecution. How, how do you overcome uh, being persecuted? Second thing I think is true not only of them, but really of all of us that are trying to follow Christ is, is you know, how do you, how do you be victorious and overcomer in the challenges simply of what it means to be a believer? Uh, we live in a world that uh, isn't always easy to follow Christ. And again, uh, we're in, in, you know, cataclysmic kind of times. So there's challenges of being a believer. And then there's the overcoming the realities uh, of what is about to come uh, in the age to come. I, I think these letters are the most practical part of the book. Uh, again, we've, we've said in our introductory material, uh, you know, Brian even mentioned it, uh, you know, a little bit earlier that this is a very complex and difficult book to understand, but the letters are probably the easiest part of the entire book to understand, and in some ways, they really are, are the most applicable uh, to our, you know, current reality and day-to-day and -day life, you know, trying to follow Christ. It's as if, as, he, as Jesus is getting ready to reveal what's coming in the future, it's as if he, he gives each of these churches a, a strategy, a strategy for overcoming, a spiritual strategy that if it is applied in the lives of the church and in the lives of the individual believers, they can then become overcomers. There's a, a number of ways that the letters can be applied. Uh, first of all, there were seven actual churches that these letters were written to, and that's always the primary application. He's speaking into uh, real situations there, again, at the end of the first century. And by the way, John, who uh, some believe is, uh, is the elder, uh, it's a title that's used in, in uh, the letters, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And there's some debate, is that John the Apostle or is it a different John? But, but you know, my sense has always been that as John, uh, when Jerusalem was destroyed and, and John moved to Ephesus and, and became kind of the spiritual father of this whole area, um, that, uh, that he knew what was going on in these churches. There's not, there's not one city uh, in the seven churches there that's further than 100 miles away. So the, these were people that probably knew each other, and at least John uh, probably had quite a bit of exposure to all seven of these churches. So the, the immediate application is to that situation. But I think that the, the reason these seven were picked, and they're very different, as we'll see in the letters, is that they, they're seven kinds of churches that really represent the church in every age. In every age, there have been churches that are lukewarm. There have been churches that have been persecuted. Uh, there have been churches that have been apostate and fallen away from the faith. And there are churches that have been faithful. And so, again, you can kind of see that uh, almost every church would fit in one of these seven slots. Some people think that 
also that, that they represent seven big periods of uh, church history and that they're sort of this continuous historical approach. I'm not going to go there. Um, probably some of you might have the old Schofield reference Bibles and uh, in there uh, Schofield was a believer in that and makes some notes. But I think maybe even more importantly than any of those is that I also think that in a sense uh, the church, each of these churches is like a, almost like a metaphor of a type of believer in any given situation. So, you know, here at Highline, you know, we, we would perhaps have people that, that would be represented by each one of these seven churches and so that the message would really speak to us very specifically. And I, I would encourage you as we go through these letters to, uh, to allow the message to almost become like a spiritual mirror that you look into and can kind of reflect upon what's going on. So, by the way, seven, I should say something about that. One of the symbols in the book of Revelation are numbers. Numbers play a very big role in the book, and seven is a critical number. It's going to appear over and over and over again. And in symbolism, biblical symbolism, uh, seven was a number of wholeness or completeness. And so the fact that seven churches are picked uh, symbolically could represent that, that it is a symbol of the whole church uh, that Jesus is speaking to. So first of these letters uh, goes to uh, the church in the city of Ephesus. And uh, if you have your Bible there at home, you might flip it open to the second chapter of Revelation. And I'm going to walk you through the first seven verses tonight. So uh, it begins by simply saying this. Now, Jesus says, says to John, write this, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. Every one of the letters has seven components to it. Uh, again, ties into this whole idea of, uh, you know, the importance of that number symbolically, but there are, there are seven components or elements in each of the letter, and the first component in every letter is what's called the commission. And so that's what we have here in verse 1. The commission tells us specifically what church is being addressed in this letter. And every one of the commissions of the seven letters begins with this phrase, to the angel of the church in blank. Now, it's interesting that earlier, and we'll see this again, uh, Jesus, in the vision that John has when he turns and sees him, is holding seven stars. And uh, you might remember that in uh, verse 20 of chapter 1, that, that Christ actually explains what those seven stars represent. He says the seven stars are the angels of the churches. Now, the problem is, we don't know what that means. And there's a lot of debate because the word, and we translate it into English as angel, the word in Greek is angelos, and literally the word means messenger. So if you happen to have a Bible that uh, is very literal in its translation, uh, your Bible might read to the messenger of the church in Ephesus. And, you know, probably the two primary ways of looking at that is number one, in every other instant outside, instance outside of the letters when this word appears in Revelation, it refers to a supernatural being, what we would think of as an angelic being. And so the, those that hold to this theory uh, would say that perhaps every church has sort of a, a spiritual being that has authority or uh, guidance over or somehow is like a guardian angel of the church and that this is who these letters are being addressed to. The second option is that messenger here might be referring to a human messenger. And in this case, uh, we would be you know, looking at this as if the letters are addressed to you know, some spiritual leader that has you know, authority over these individual churches. And you know, we, we just aren't sure. 
Uh, I tend to lean toward the second, uh, you know, that somehow, you know, if it's an angel, why does Jesus need to address a letter to an angel? Uh, although many commentators believe, based upon the fact that this is the way the word is used more consistently in the rest of the book, that that's what John is looking at. So there's a messenger. We aren't quite sure what it is, but uh, the letters are addressed to them, these seven letters. Although at the end of every letter, Jesus says, you know, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so again, the, each of these messages has a, has a broader context. So uh, again, the second thing that every one of these commissions says that it's written to this messenger of the church. And uh, we ought to just, you know, make a brief comment about, well, well what does that mean? And church uh, that appears here in the book of Revelation in these texts is the Greek word ekklesia. Um, and Jesus uses this word back in the Gospels when he makes a statement, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's made up of two little Greek words, uh, the uh, uh, prefix ek and then klesia, and it literally means to call out. And it was a word, it was not a religious word, it was a word that was used to talk about a gathered assembly of people that were called out for some specific purpose. Now, usually, you know, uh, perhaps a, a civic or, or some kind of a government meeting where they, they, the citizens of a city would be called to come together and to gather. Well, the difference here, the thing that makes it different than the secular use of the word is that, is that Jesus said, I'll build my church, my gathered assembly, those that I call to come out, to come together, uh, to be mine. It, he's the reason that were called out. He's the one that, that is really in control and in charge of the assembly. You got to remember that even by this point in time, and we're down line a bit, uh, you know, 60 years after Jesus, maybe a little longer even, uh, you know, we're at least 30, 35 years after the death of Peter and Paul. Um, all the other apostles uh, have passed away. Uh, they've all been martyred in one form or another. Uh, Jerusalem's been destroyed. I mean, things have really changed. But even at this point in early church history, th there weren't buildings you know, oftentimes when we think about the word church, we think about the, you know, the building, oh, I'm going to go to church. But the church at this point in time, and it's really true theologically and in our time also, uh, simply were men and women that, that gathered together in the name of Christ for four main reasons. They came together to worship together. Uh, we're told in Acts chapter 2, they came together to have fellowship together, which is kind of difficult right now in our context, obviously. Uh, they came together for teaching, the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and then they, they broke bread together. Uh, they, they broke bread, and they did it in a way that we would now probably call communion. My, my own feeling being that, that, again, it was probably more like what Jesus did in the upper room, that they were gathered together, they shared a meal, but when they broke the bread and when they passed the cup, they remembered Christ. Uh, the other thing is kind of interesting as we get into these letters is that it would appear that really the idea is there's one church in any city. Now we know that in cities where there were large numbers of believers, that they met in homes. They, and homes were not very big, obviously, in, in this period of time. But there were small groups that met together in homes. But together, in any one city, that was the church. So there was one church in Ephesus. Hard to imagine in our time because, you know, churches seem to be so disconnected from each other and, and the idea that there's one church in Denver or one church in Dallas, like my friend Jim, where my friend Jim Wilson uh, lives and I think he's watching tonight. So um, the, the, the church, every city was viewed as having one church and yet even those Churches were part of one universal church, one church of all of those in whom Christ dwells by his spirit. Now, this particular church, we're told, is in the city of Ephesus. And Ephesus was 
the mother church of this area. Uh, it's kind of interesting. You can kind of see uh, now where those, the different uh, cities were located that the letters are addressed to. But Ephesus was kind of the, you know, the, the mother church here. Um, out of Paul's ministry in the book of Acts, uh, a church was planted in Ephesus, and we believe that it was uh, believers from that church in Ephesus that then over time planted churches in all of these cities around Asia Minor. Um, if, if you get a chance to visit in Ephesus, uh, I've had the chance to go there a couple of times. Uh, you sail into the port of uh, Kusadasi, Turkey, and of course it's a modern city and uh, it, when you're there, there are a lot of uh, cruise ships that are there, many of them, to, uh, to take trips inland. At a point in time, Ephesus was the greatest city in this part of the world. And it was a city that uh, was a harbor town. Uh, unfortunately, at a point in time, uh, one of the, uh, the rulers of this area decided that uh, to make the port more efficient, he, he was going to narrow it in. And when that happened, the, the port began to build up with silt until today, if you go to see the city of Ephesus, it's six miles inland uh, from what it used to be sitting right there on the ocean. So there was some decline when the harbor silted up, but it was an amazing city. Uh, estimates of its population, and again, uh, a little bit hard, you, there's quite a range here, anywhere from 100,000 people perhaps, all the way up to maybe as many as a million people that might have lived in the city of Ephesus. Ephesus. It, it was a center of commerce. It was right on a major trade route that linked east and west. Uh, it was a city with a lot of culture to it. Uh, it was a city that had a lot of religion uh, apart from uh, the early church. And what it was perhaps best known for was that there was a temple there uh, to the Greek goddess Artemis, or Diana. Uh, she was the goddess of the hunt uh, in Greek mythology. She was the sister of Apollo. And uh, there was a temple there. Uh, the footprint was 100,000 square feet. It had 100 columns. It was, uh, it was gorgeous. And it was one of what we call the seven wonders of the ancient world. And that's what Ephesus was known for. And into this city, uh, Paul comes, uh, shares the, the message about Christ, and a church uh, it comes to life there in Ephesus, and, and again, kind of becomes the, the, the mother church of this whole area. And interestingly, when you think about it, this was John's home church. Uh, this was where he, we believe, lived and where he ministered out of and, again, probably uh, had quite a bit of influence in all of these cities. But, but the first letter then is addressed to the church in this city of Ephesus. First component, commission. Secondly, uh, well, it, here's another little look at uh, one of the cruise ships coming in. And Oh, I was going to tell you, the, the Ephesus is also... Uh, one of the most amazing archaeological sites in the world. And, and if you go there, you literally walk the same streets that Paul would have walked. Uh, this is a uh, partial uh, reconstruction of the library there in Ephesus. They had a massive uh, uh, amphitheater. It would seat about 25,000 people. And uh, so again, you kind of get a sense. Uh, and then, of course, you know, I just thought you might want to see that uh, they didn't have the coronavirus because their toilets weren't spaced quite as far apart as we should be if we're really following the rules, but uh, this is a public uh, facility. So uh, archaeology, the archaeology of the area is quite interesting. Okay, every letter then uh, has a characteristic of Christ, and, and usually uh, almost all of these will be some dimension either of what John saw when he saw the risen Christ, or something that is said about the risen Christ in chapter 1. And in this case, here is what Jesus says about himself. Okay? These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. 
Again, we kind of know what this imagery is simply because, again, I think it's, if I've got the text here, again, in uh, verse 20 of chapter 1, uh, Jesus explained that the lampstands that he, he, he was seen in the midst of uh, the lampstands uh, it, there in chapter 1. Now he walks among the lampstands here in, uh, in this little message that he, he gives to them. And uh, Biff, my, uh, my, uh, my uh, videos just went out. Uh, so you see if you can get that going again, and I'll, uh, I'll keep, I'll keep uh, you know, cruising along here. So again, uh, okay, now that's, we need to go back there. Uh, you need to go back again, back again. There, just hold that for one second. And Biff, you can come on up here and uh, work on that. Uh, so, uh, here, again, the golden lampstands, Jesus has said, they, they represented the churches themselves, so Christ in the midst of the church, and again, the, the uh, seven stars that he holds in his hand uh, are symbols of the you know, spiritual or human leadership of the individual churches. Um, a great image, by the way. Jesus at the center of the church walking in its midst. One of the things I think you'll see as we go through each of these letters is that what he reveals about himself seems to have a connection to what's going on in the life of this church. And what we're going to see about the church in Ephesus was that it was a church that had some misplaced priorities. Um, it was a second generation church. Uh, I'm going to suggest that maybe what was going on there was that there was too much religion and not enough Jesus. We'll see what that means in a minute. And uh, that they'd lost that priority of relationship with Christ. And so to emphasize who he is, he's the Lord of the church. He's the one that walks in the midst of the lampstands, in the midst of the church, and again holds and controls in his right hand the leadership of the church. So, uh, so a characteristic every one of the letters has. Third, every letter has uh, what I'm going to call a commendation. Now, at some point as we go through these letters, I'm going to go back and say, well, I, I wasn't 100% truthful because actually there are two churches that have no commendation. So that's kind of the bad news churches when we look at them. But generally speaking, uh, what Jesus wants to do is he wants to reflect upon what they're doing that's pleasing to him. And in every one of the letters, he says this, I know your deeds. And then he's going to launch into um, what's going on in this church that's pleasing to him. So here's what he says to the church in Ephesus. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you can't tolerate wicked people, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You've persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. And then I'm actually dropping down a few verses to tie it together here. A little later he'll say, you hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. There's five things that Christ likes that are going on here in the church uh, that are good. They're, they're getting a lot of things right. And uh, when you look at what he has just commended them, you could kind of say it this way. Um, this is a church that's working hard. Uh, they're, they're toiling. And really the word has that sense to it. Uh, they're doing some good things. They're, they're engaged in, in good works that uh, would bring glory to God. And that's a good thing. And, and Christ commends them for that. I know your works. Uh, secondly, he commends them for their obedience. Uh, this, this is a church that uh, would uh, not allow moral or ethical compromise. Now, when we get down into some of the other letters, we're going to see that was not the case in all of these churches. But in Ephesus, he says, you can't tolerate wicked men. And so it was a church that was obedient uh, to Christ. Uh, third, it was uh, a church that I think had sound theology. 
Uh, he says that, you know, you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are false. And one of the, you know, the major uh, problems that the early church was encountering at this point in time was that they, there was an infiltration of a lot of false theology and false teachers. And we'll, again, keep coming back to that idea. But this was, this was a church that tested those that claimed to be apostles, traveling ministers, traveling evangelists. This was very normal in, in the first century church. And, and they would come into a town and they would, they would seek out uh, people that were part of the church there, and they would, uh, they would get lodging, and they would be fed, and, and sometimes they would uh, you know, get paid for being there, and yet it was abuse. There were, there were false teachers that were taking advantage of that. It was a church that was steadfast. They endured hardships. They persevered. They'd not grown weary. And then finally, it was a church that, again, had, had purity, uh, they hated the practice of the Nicolaitans. I'll explain what that means in a bit. Uh, probably the idea here is that um, they, they hadn't caved in to what we'll see in some of the other letters of what you might call a distorted grace, uh, cheap grace, where under the banner of grace there was uh, idolatry and immorality going on, but that was not happening here. As a matter of fact, they hated the practice of the Nicolaitans, and Jesus hated that too. So lots of good things going on. I, I, my hunch is that, you know, from a human perspective, if you were to look at, at this particular church, everything looks good. Uh, I mean, they're doing all the right stuff, and uh, um, they've got a lot of good things going on. But internally, uh, something had gone wrong. And uh, what had gone wrong was very serious. They, they had lost, in a sense, the very purpose for which the church exists, its primary purpose. And part of, I think, what happens here is, again, uh, this is, you know, perhaps 45 years from the time when the church was started under the ministry of Paul. It's a second-generation church, and, uh, and they have a problem. And the problems... Uh, in each of these letters show up under the fourth element in every letter, which is a critique. And so when Christ is going to commend what's good, but he's going to critique the problems. And, uh, and we see this here at this point in the letter. So he says, yet, you know, given all of that good thing, all of those good things, yet I hold this against you. And here is their problem. You have forsaken your first love. This is a pretty powerful statement, actually, because the word to forsake uh, can have a kind of a variety of uh, emphasis to it. Uh, it can mean you could, you, you've left, uh, but th look at sort of the emotional uh, connotations of some of the other meanings. You've deserted your first love. You've abandoned your first love. You've neglected your first love. And what's your first love? And uh, I, I really think that the first love of the church, the main thing, and you probably have heard that old expression that the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing in the church is really twofold. Uh, and that's to love Christ and to love one another. Uh, some translators have uh, uh, kind of translated as if when they've forsaken their first love, that they just, they weren't loving. But, but it's bigger than that, because it's not simply talking about love in a generic sense. It's really talking about love in the sense of our commitment to Jesus. And, uh, you know, so when Jesus was asked the question, what's the greatest commandment? And I always, I always, you know, kind of paraphrased it as if this, you know, this scribe was wondering, man, there is so much stuff in the law and the Torah and the prophets and the writings. And, man, I, you know, it's overwhelming. But, you know, is, is there some way that you can take it and you can kind of boil it down to what's the most important part of the law? And Jesus knew how to respond immediately. He said, yes. He said, it's this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind with all your strength. That's the first and greatest commandment. And second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. This is what Jesus was all about. This is 
part of why he came not only to redeem us, but to bring us back into a love relationship with himself and then to become a community that really loves one another. And somehow the main purpose to love God and to love one another has somehow, it's something's gone wrong here in Ephesus. I mean, orthodoxy, correct belief, it, it, it's good. Uh, ministry, good works, it's good. Purity, obedience, it's good. But when orthodoxy or ministry or even purity become the main focus of the church and, and love for Jesus and love for each other grows cold, what you end up with is a dead orthodoxy. And Christ confronts this. And I think really it's, it's kind of the constant challenge uh, of the Christian life, both corporately and personally, is, is how do we keep Christ first? How, how do we make that, that what we're all about, both as a, a body of believers and, and in relationship to Jesus and to one another? And it, it, the good news is, is that hopefully that would have been the response of those that were receiving the letter. You know, you know if that's true, how do we get back? to, you know, what would be pleasing to you. And in every one of the letters, he not only gives a critique, he gives a correction. So he, he's going to tell them what they need to do to get back on track. And in this particular letter, he, he, really, he really tells them that they, they need to do three things. And they all begin with R. So if you can remember the three R's, instead of reading and writing and arithmetic, uh, uh, remember these three R's. The first thing he said is remember. Remember the height from which you have fallen. That's a great image. That's a really strong image because, again, I think the tendency, apart from being confronted about their situation, could have been a sense within the church itself, hey, everything's pretty good here. You know, look at all the good things we're doing. You know, we've, we're, we're getting it right here. But by losing that kind of passion for Christ, uh, Jesus says, boy, look at the heights from which you have fallen, that, that, that love for me is so much more important than these other things. You need to remember what it was like when you loved me and you loved each other more than anything else. So personal commitment to Christ, it's the starting point, uh, opening our life to him, uh, really kind of turning the you know, inner throne of our life over and, and inviting him to be Lord and to, to reign over us and, and just making him number one in our life. Remember, Jesus says to them. Then he gives them a second correction. Repent. Now, this word will appear periodically throughout the book of Revelation. And it, it's a word, uh, the Greek word metanoia, that we translate repent. It, it literally means to... Uh, uh, to change your mind. Uh, but the idea is that, that you, you make a turn. It's almost like you're heading in one direction and, and suddenly you've you got to stop, you've got to rethink things, and rethinking things you realize you're heading in the wrong direction and so you make a turn around. You do a 180 to get back going the right direction. And that's what Jesus is saying. Okay, you know, you're, you're forsaking your first love. And even though all of these things you're doing are great, you're, you're heading away from me. And you need to stop. You need to repent. You need to turn around and begin to head back toward me. And then interestingly, the third word, is he, he says, repeat the things you did at first. Now, we aren't exactly sure what those things might be, but, but I got a couple of ideas about what they might be. Uh, because what, what is it that in the early days of our relationship with Jesus, what, what were the things that really um, helped us grow in our love for him and to grow in our love for one another? And uh, I, I think, you know, th these are the things I think about. Uh, first of all, you know, what, what did you used to do you need to repeat? Well, uh, time alone with Christ. Uh, there, there's really nothing that, that 
can substitute for our individual time alone with Jesus. And, and, you know, for most of us, that means setting aside some time to spend time in the Word and to reflect and meditate on Scripture and to spend time talking with Him uh, in prayer. And this is something that really is kind of a one-on-one uh, with Jesus. And it's part, I think, of what perhaps was uh, part of what in the early part of the life of the church they did, and they need to repeat that, get back to that. Uh, Secondly, time together with Jesus and coming together corporately as a body and and worshiping together, which was part of life in the early church. We can't do that right now, and and it's it's hard because there is a, uh, you know, there's something that happens when we come together and in heartfelt worship together we, you know, we spend time with Christ in fellowship and in worship and and uh, they needed to get back to that. You know, maybe they were going through the motions, but there, there really wasn't that time together with Jesus. And then the third thing is time both alone and together in terms of serving Christ, both in terms of our witness uh, to Jesus and in terms of really ser- serving him, that if we've drifted from that, we need to repeat those things. So remember, repent, and repeat. And then the sixth component of every one of these letters that uh, we see is what uh, I'm simply calling the call. And Jesus, he, he, he says this after he's gone through all this with each of the churches. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Uh, I taught through the seven letters in, uh, at Narrowgate, our, our men's Bible study group on Wednesdays. And, you know, what I, I kept saying is, here's what he's saying. Pay attention. This is important. Listen to what I have to say. And uh, if you have ears, hear what the Spirit is trying to say to you. And again, I think that's a challenge to all of us as we move through the book of Revelation. So the call. And then the seventh component is a challenge that he gives in each of the letters. And the challenge also has a promise that goes with it. And so here's the challenge. To the one who is victorious or the one who overcomes, and that's that word we talked about a little bit earlier, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. I think that the overcomer, in the letters, I'm going to make a suggestion. The overcomer is the one that responds to the confrontation by making the correction. So they acknowledge where they're off track. Uh, Jesus has told them, here's something you need to do to get back on track. And if you do that, the end result is that you're going to be, you're going to be an overcomer. You're going you're gonna to win the battle. You know, you're going you're to make it through whatever it is that's going on. And so to that person, that man or woman who, uh, who overcomes, the first promise of the letters is this, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. And of course, that kind of points us all the way back to the early chapters of Genesis, where uh, as a result of the fall uh, of humanity, really death and uh, disease and and, uh, so many of the things that uh, are part of life in a fallen world became realities. And, And you'll remember, and I think this was a mercy of God, he didn't want humanity to live forever in that state. And therefore, he made sure that they didn't have access to the tree of life because had they eaten from the tree of life, they would have lived forever. And again, all of this symbolic imagery here in the book of Revelation, but it's as if Jesus is saying what was lost in the garden and was restored by me, by what I did at the cross, will be fully experienced in your life When the new Jerusalem comes, here he refers to it as the paradise of God. When we get to the end of the book, uh, we're going to see that 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 paradise, which simply meant a garden, by the way, is all that the word meant. uh, But that is all will be fully experienced in in what Revelation tells us is the new uh, Jerusalem, that it is eternal 
life, both in terms of its duration and in terms of its quality. Life forever, forever living in loving relationship with Christ and with each other. So I would say this at the end of this first letter, it seems to me that, again, if you, if you just look for a strategy, you know, one big takeaway from each of these letters, I think the strategy uh, of the letter to Ephesus is really quite simple. It is keep Christ first. And that just requires us kind of taking a good, hard look at what's going on in our own life, uh, whether we've allowed self or ego to kind of take control and we aren't, we aren't really in the kind of relationship with Jesus we know we need to be. And, and if that's the case, you know what Jesus said, it's time to kind of remember and you know, make a turn and, and, and get back into the kind of relationship with him where he is first in your life and where he is your first love and that you've no longer forsaken him. So keep Christ first. That's the first seven letters that we're going to look at as we move through these chapters in Revelation. Next week, a little teaser, uh, the church in Smyrna, and teaser simply to say this, this is one of two churches where Jesus has nothing bad to say about the church. So this is one that we're going to want to really take a look at and say, what is it that is so pleasing to Christ about this church? So, Let's pray together. Lord, we are uh, grateful tonight that in the same way that you were concerned about uh, the men and women that uh, belong to you in Ephesus, that you are concerned with the men and women that are uh, tonight gathered around computers or televisions that are tonight uh, looking into your word and that the message to the Ephesians here in this letter is really a message to us too. And Lord, I know uh, it's so easy to drift, uh, so easy to uh, forsake our first love. And uh, I think sometimes, I'm not even sure I know what that means, Lord, uh, but you want us to, uh, to draw back close to you uh, you desire that we would be in a loving relationship with you and that, and that we'd really learn to love one another. And we, we pray that you would work in our lives by your spirit uh, to make those things a reality. And again, we're, we're simply grateful that we have the privilege of looking at a letter that you, you personally dictated and uh, that you want to use it to speak to us. Thank you for this time together tonight. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, Dr. Bob. Biff. Thank you so much. That was so insightful and wonderful. And I know that you came up with three important questions that you want mm. people to kind of get around their tables at home and talk about. Yes. And those three questions are... All right. Here's what I came up with. Uh, I didn't know, since I didn't know, I knew we wouldn't be around tables, but wherever you are, here's some questions you can ask. The first question is this. Uh, when, when you look at those five areas of strength there in the church in Ephesus, uh, which of those do you think is your greatest strength? And then in the same way, go back through those five and ask the question, which of those uh, is, is your greatest weakness? And I know that some of you are, are still kind of doing uh, virtual groups and are going to have some discussion, so that should give you some time to talk about that. And then this is a tough one, I think. I think the third question is this, you know, what is it in your life that what kind of hinders you uh, from keeping Christ first. That's kind of a, you know, that's, that's a toughie. You've got to, you know, be honest with one another. So uh, why don't you discuss these three questions, and then uh, we look forward to being together uh, again next week.